hey, somebody's got to change the calendar to the page with the pumpkin. You did? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to The Professional Noticer. Here, you and I will use common sense and all the wisdom we can muster to move beyond what is true and go all the way to the truth. With actual listeners in more than 100 countries, I am The Professional Noticer. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or a coach. I want to help you live the life of your wildest dreams by giving you access to the greatest mentors the world has to offer today. Our sponsor this week is Kamado Joe Grills, the very best grills. You know, it's not even close. There are quite a few Kamado-style grills available now, but there's only one Kamado Joe. They're in different sizes, and they were created by guys who really cooked, but were eh, not real happy with the the stuff they were having to cook on, the, the, the grills they were having to use. Now, it's not just that they were the wrong color. Uh, some of the parts were not the best quality and so they made the very best Kamado style cooker Kamado Joe and you know my family uses Kamado Joe's to cook pizzas and to smoke meats and and grill incredible burgers and to to cook steaks yeah you can sear that steak at 750 degrees and turn that thing back down and then slow cook it to the rest of the way. Kamada Joe, and whatever size you want, with their special, you, you need to get their special charcoal. This stuff, I mean, there are charcoal chunks that are this big. They're as big as your head. And um, they're, they're just awesome. Kamada Joe. Check out KamadaJoe.com. And go see them wherever fine grills are sold. No, wherever the finest grills are sold. Observations and answers, that's what we do here on The Professional Noticer. Uh, We appreciate you joining us each week. And, you know, sometimes we have people who have observations and answers. And sometimes we have some people who are very special who have found some answers for themselves and provide observations for all of us. We have today uh, somebody that's very special to me. I get to introduce, I I believe I'm introducing him to uh, many of you. His name is Michael Perry, and Michael is a New York Times bestselling author. He's He's a humorist, he's a playwright, a radio show host. And And for those of you who have followed me, you might start seeing some similarities here because I have noticed some similarities in the six or seven years that I have followed Michael. Now, Michael and I have never actually met, okay? We've never shaken hands. We've never locked eyes across a a table. Um, I don't even think Michael knows who I am. And of course, that's fine. But I am like this little girl screaming teenage fan of Michael Perry. And so I want to welcome Michael Perry to the professional noticer. Mike, thank you for being here. Uh, It's my pleasure to be here. (laughs) You you have no idea how I found you. And and first of all, where are you today? Are you are you in New Auburn, Wisconsin? I am not in New Auburn. I'm about 40 minutes from there. I grew up in a uh, I grew up on a little dairy farm north of New Auburn, Wisconsin. At the time I went to school in New Auburn, it was population 383. I graduated from high school. I left for 12 years and I returned 12 years later. Uh, at which point the population had swollen to 485, and. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, bought a house on Main Street, and I lived there for another 12 years. And then uh, after 39 years of bachelorhood, I got married, and we were looking for a farm, and uh, we were able to find one about 40 minutes from New Auburn. So I still get up to New Auburn all the time. My kin live there. A lot of the folks I've written about I still see up there. Right now, I'm 
out in the country, we live on a farm. I'm in a little room over the top of my garage where I do my writing and a lot of my recording. I'm looking out the window at the back 40. And um, just this morning, a nice buck walked through the yard. So that was Get perfect. Get out of here. God, that kills me. Yeah. But, uh, see, that's so, one of the things you and I have in common that you don't know yet. But uh, are you looking at the, at, at the coop, by the way? Uh, if I get out of frame, I can actually see it down there. Yeah, it's down okay. past uh, the, the big swing set on the hill. And uh, I did feed the chickens in the rain this morning. So I've, Oh, I've, my gosh. Yeah. Well, we're, I'm going to explain a little more about the coop in a second. But I have to tell you first, before we really get going, I have to tell you how I found you. Um, I was in uh, Spring Green, Wisconsin. Oh. I was up there for a client. This was... Uh, probably six years ago. And um, the, the client is, uh, the home office is in Madison. They have a, a place there in Spring Green. And I was I was staying there and I'd gone into town, never been there before. And so I'm drawn to these independent bookstores. And I went in Arcadia Books. And I, I, was, I was planning on going to that grocery store that's right down the street from there. But I, I went in the bookstore first. I thought, man, they're liable to close at five. And I went in, and I'm, I'm just kind of quietly looking around. And a lady comes up to me, and she says, Excuse me, would you please follow me into the basement? A tornado has been spotted uh, a block away, and, and we're taking everybody into the basement. And so I, I was like, well, oh, oh, okay. Now, I have a pathological fear of being bored. And so as I'm rounding the steps there, I grab a book because I thought, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. And I, and I grab a Coke out of the cooler. So I got a, I got a book and I don't even know what book I've gotten. All right. So I go down and here, man, people are swarming. Evidently, this is the only basement on the block. But there's cats, dogs, babies, probably 40 people down there. And, and you know, tornadoes just kind of, they, they come through pretty quickly, but I, I'm I'm telling you, after about 45 minutes, I would kind of had it. You know, I, I'm thinking you, you, we should either be dead or it's gone. And but everybody was seeing me to have a good time. But but I, I was I kind of had it. A lot of a lot of dogs, a lot of cats, a lot of babies. And I'm thinking I got to get to the grocery store. So I I look upstairs and it doesn't seem to be gone up there to me. So I find the lady. I hand her twenty dollars. I said, "Hey, I I got a book and I got a, a a coke and this should cover it." And thank you very much. And so, I get out of there. Well, I throw the book over in the side. I get back to the house and I put the book somewhere at the house. And a week later, I'm leaving the house and I pack the book up and and uh, and I, I kind of vaguely realized that I had picked it up off the regional author's table and. Got home to Orange Beach, Alabama, and put the book over somewhere. And and at some point, two or three months later, I pick up Population 485. Mm. I pick up this book. And, and it's, it's Population 485, Meeting Your Neighbors One Siren at a Time. I thought, ah, that's, that's a cool subtitle. And Michael Perry, and I turn it around. I look at Michael Perry on the back. And I, I start reading, and within like three pages, I stop, and I went and found my wife, and I said, I don't know who this guy is, but this guy is great. Wow. It's great. And, and, and so I keep reading, and I, and I keep dog-earing places, and I go into my wife and I say, okay, listen to this part. Listen to this. Listen to this. Just listen to this sentence. And, and man, I'm telling you, I became a fan Right then, Population 45, I looked you up. I started buying all your books, and, and I, you know, I, I got Coop. I got From the Top. I got Danger Man working. I, I got the Jesus Cow. I got Visiting Tom. I got Truck, A Love Story. I got all your essay books. I got the Big Top from Chautauqua. I, I have all these books, and so I'm I'm, I'm telling you this story at the same time I'm telling everybody else how I found you. And usually the people that I have as a guest on the show, I, I am already friends. But 
But Mike, I want to be your friend. You're like my favorite author. <laughs> You're very kind. I, I just, um, <clears throat> boy, you know, I, I mentioned already, I was a farm kid. I grew up on a small dairy farm, grew up milking cows and baling hay and plowing. And um, in the winter, we logged. So I grew up logging. Uh, at the age of 16, I started working on a ranch in, in Wyoming, a regular work in beef and hay ranch. I worked there for the next five summers. That's basically how I put myself through college. I got a nursing degree, uh, I, and uh, I, I, I always joke that uh, I was the only cowboy in all of Wyoming who was putting himself through nursing school, um, <laughs> based on some of the conversations I had around the old Brandon fire. But I never planned any of this. Um, I'm still, to this day, I, you know, New York Times bestselling author. It's true. I, I hit the list once. Um, and I, and I, I love that they put that on the cover because it, it does uh, help get a little attention. But the fact is, uh, we're a little self-employed family. Um, my books sell well enough that if I keep hustling, we make a, a decent living. Um, but I have uh, to supplement it with speaking and touring. And of course, a lot of that's been cut back right now. Um, but it always comes back to just watching my dad get up in the morning and, and milk the cows and then do it again that night, uh, every, twice a day, every day. And I have visions of us being at family get togethers and stuff. And <clears throat> at 4.30, he would always push the chair back and say, well, those cows aren't going to milk themselves. And he'd head, uh, we'd head back home. And so uh, when I hear someone say the, the kind things you did, there are two things that happen. Number one is I just have to acknowledge that I've been helped every step of the way by people I didn't realize were helping me. And, and we can get into that a little more too, like how I came to love that's, writing. And, um, yeah, that's but, a lot of us, boy. Yeah. And, and also just the fact that I, I always feel compelled. You know, my parents tried to teach us two things, charity and humility. And by charity, I don't mean just throwing a buck in the jar. I mean, in how you treat right. uh, the, fo the how, folks around. How many, how many brothers and sisters did you have, Mike? And, and just explain why I even asked that question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. And the reason I don't is that um, my parents took in innumerable uh, foster children. I have several adopted siblings. Um, my mom, especially, she too was a nurse um, and worked in the hospital until I was probably around third or fourth grade and then just started taking in uh, children who had required a very high level of care, including right. medical. These, these were not just kids that didn't have parents. These were kids that had other issues as well. Yeah, we had, uh, like, I, I grew up, you know, all of us kids, we, we grew up learning how to change out oxygen tanks, how to do a G-tube feeding at the supper table. It just wasn't a big deal. And, and also a lot of what I guess you would call special needs kids, too. So uh, it was just ever changing. I would always say I'd come home from college and, you know, you'd look around the table and go, well, I don't know who that is, but I guess they're part of the family. <laughs> My other favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes of my dad, who is a very quiet man, but he, he's wry. He's got that kind of humor. And we always had, you know, between six to 10 people at the table on any given night. And we'd have company over and, and they'd, they'd, you know, you'd pass the hot dish around or whatever the first time. And of course, the person who was a guest take a very polite little spoonful and pass it on. And my dad was always say, he'd always say, get what you need now because it ain't coming around again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one, the one, the one, one thing I did feel compelled to say uh, is just that it's, I'm, I'm so grateful when someone says kind things about my writing and I work really hard at it. It doesn't come easily. Writing for me is like carving concrete with a spoon. But I, I also I, feel, I feel compelled to say that on any given day, I can't live up to my prose. I'm a stumbling, bumbling guy. I, you know, I'm an imperfect father, an imperfect husband. I'm, I'm self-employed trying to make a living. I, I put the, I sneak the art and the heart in there wherever I can, but I always want people to know it's just like, you know, my brother's a logger and, and we just show up and, and, and move. Well, we both sell trees basically. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Just in different ways that, you know, one of the things that the people who, people who have followed me for a while, they know that, it, that I, I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm not after. Uh, I'm not after sponsors. I'm not after. You know, I'm not just going to tell somebody something just to make some money. Or, uh, and, and if I tell somebody, hey, 
you need to do this? We have a lot of people that do it, but I I also understand that that's a great responsibility because one screw up and they and people doubt me, okay? And so I've been very careful through the years to be very honest with the people that that I'm fortunate enough to have as friends who follow me and 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 so I, I want you guys who are listening listen to this very carefully because I'm I'm just telling you uh, there's a there's a couple of people in my life that I have read that uh, it, it it and don't take this wrong Mike but there are a couple of people that I've read that it makes me mad. Uh, when I read their stuff and realize that not as many people know them as should. Now, you're the only one of those two that's alive, okay? Because uh, the other one is a guy named Robert Rourke, uh, who wrote a, a book called The Old Man and the Boy. And if and I don't know if you've read that or not, but if you haven't, I'll send you one. Because The Old Man and the Boy, I, it was written before I was born. And... And it was uh, it's, it's a story of this, uh, um, this this boy and his grandfather who teaches him to hunt and fish and about the wisdom of the woods and the things the life lessons and and um, the book is brilliant it's just brilliant and and when I was turned on to it uh, as an adult I it was all, less than ten years ago I. I I started giving them away, and on the paperback it says, uh, at the bottom of it it says, um, more than one hundred and fifty thousand copies in print. And I told my wife, I said, you know what? This really pisses me off that that I have actually sold a million of anything, and something this good has only sold 150,000 copies. This is so much better than anything I've ever written. And so I have friends in Wisconsin, and I say, you know Michael Perry is? Do you read Michael Perry? And they go, nice, I, I know I've heard that, which I understand because, you know, I'm not famous enough that anybody would go, oh, there's Andy Andrews. I'm famous enough that people go, did I go to high school with you? You, you know, and and so I'm just telling people, you know, I don't know what you would say start with. I say start with Population 485 because because I did. But Coop, the, the book is brilliant. When did you when did you realize? Uh, because you, you obviously you didn't go to journalism school. When did you realize that you could do this? Well. I'm Still working on that. Um, I understand. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. This is hard for me too. Yeah, um, and, I, and I was not the best writer in my senior English class. Yeah. So I think first of all, I would just quickly say, people always ask me what's my favorite book. I've written about twelve or thirteen of them now, fourteen, fifteen. I'm not sure. Um, and I don't have a favorite. I put uh, there's not a single book, and I, and I know you're the same. There's not a single book or an essay or piece of writing that I've put out into the world that I didn't give my best to. So there's not one uh, anything out there that I'm aware of or that I can recall. Maybe I should say that I go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But there's no question. <laughs> There's no question that Population 485, uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't for that book. And it was above all a privilege to write that book because I was allowed to write from a place I cared deeply about while I was in that place, but also revisiting that place, which gave it a whole nother uh, angle. As far as the writing. Wait also, a minute, I think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, let's go back to the writing. Uh, on yeah. Population 485, you left this town. And yep. you left this town a long-haired football player. A uh, short-haired come... football player. Because I short... dad wouldn't, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Short-haired football player. Yeah. And I would uh, say I left, town a, I left town a, uh, a, a good student, a farm boy, and a fair defensive end. I returned 12 years later a long-haired writer with soft hands and a nursing degree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. And the, but well, there was the a certain amount of... <laughs> There was a certain amount of street cred to recover with some of my buddies in the coon hunting crowd, Alice. 
<laughs> and as you and can you, see, the hair situation has evolved. <laughs> yeah, I see. I can see that. I can see that. And and so you, th- this book, though, uh, one of the things that struck me about this right off the bat, something that I think, is, I, I don't know that somebody can really learn it. I think somebody can develop it, but a book that that can make you laugh out loud, that can make you stop and think, a book that can make you reread a part just because it's beautiful, and a book that can make you cry and feel very deeply. It's a rare book. This is a rare book, but this is your story. Yeah, it's, again, to be able to be centered, but again, having had that 12 years away, so I was sort of, I wasn't a complete outsider, but I was definitely seeing through different eyes when I came back. The other thing I think that that helps me here is that I wasn't the person who hung out with the fire department for two weeks and then told everybody how it was. I was on the fire department. I was going into the burning barn with my brother on the nozzle and um, was making calls to car wrecks and um, and I don't, none of that is couched in heroic terms. As a matter of fact, I go kind of the other way on that stuff, but, um, it really helped. And even the joking part about, there's no question. There were parts of my life, my appearance, maybe my beliefs and interests that some of my roughneck buddies weren't completely down with, but at the end of the day, they knew I would grab a hose and run into the burning barn. And that really, I think it gave me access and trust and, and, a word that's pretty important when you're trying to write uh, nonfiction, it gave me veracity. And, you know, that's, um, we can argue, everybody argues about truth with a capital T, but as far as the facts, as far as being on the ground, if I told you what it smelled like after a fire where, you know, the wet smoke and ash and the steam, well, that's because I suck some of that down into my lungs. Right. Right. I don't think I answered your question about how I got to be writing, a writer. I want, I want to hear that, though. I want to okay. hear, how did you, how did you, when, when did you realize that you could do this? And I'm, was, I'm sure it was an evolution, but. Oh, yeah, it was over stages. It all begins with my mother and the fact that I was raised, I was raised in an obscure fundamentalist Christian sect. I like to say that because it makes people nervous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just choked on my own joke there, but um, but it was above all loving, and but it, because it was quite strict, we had no television, no radio, uh, no dancing, no movies. Um, but my mother was a reader, and she she would take us to the, the tiny little local rural library. She filled the house with books. She read to me. I was the firstborn, so I got pampered a little bit. Um, and she would read to me all the time. And, and even as a young child, um, she would, she would, I would bug her to read to me so much that she had to give herself a break. And so one of the stories I tell is she would read a chapter of Winnie the Pooh to me. And we're talking about the thick text heavy book, not the Disney picture book, the, the, right, the old, right, I can right. see it. She would read a chapter of Winnie the Pooh and then aloud to me. And then she would hand me that book and she would read a chapter of whatever she was reading to herself and I just had to sit there with that book. And, and it took me years to realize what a gift she'd given me. She had taught me to love the idea of sitting quietly with a book even before I could read it. And then, like so many little kids, I started picking out letters and some sounds. And so she sent away, which is a phrase you have to be of a certain age to remember even that phrase. She sent away for a phonics book from a Chicago newspaper. It was a big cartoon book. I still have it. And she taught me to read using that phonics book. So I could read by the time I was four. And I just started reading voraciously and have read voraciously ever since. That's why um, to this day, I can't diagram a sentence. You listen to me talk. I talk like uh, where I come from, you know, but I can write by ear. I have many friends who are musicians, pr- including professionals, and, you, and, and they, they kind of break down into two sets. You got the crew that can sit down with a sheet of music and play it flawlessly, having never seen it before. And then you got the folks who can sit in with the band and play a song and take a solo on a song they've never played before, but they play by ear. So I kind of had language in me just from all that reading. In seventh grade, I had an English teacher who I was just a football playing, pickup truck loving, deer hunting, knucklehead, you know, farm kid. 
And one day we showed up for English class and she, she had put a black and white photo of an old farmhouse on the blackboard. And she said, your assignment today is to write whatever you want about this picture. Well, we were baffled. We didn't know how to act with all that freedom. We were so used to underline the noun, circle the verb or whatever it was. And I remember writing and being about three sentences into it. And it was, it was pretty awful. I found it recently. You know, I'm an old man returned to the farmhouse of my childhood, <laughs> yonder the clover fields of my youth, you know, that kind of thing. But I also remember getting an actual visceral thrill at the act of creation and the idea that I could create whatever story I wanted about this place. Then went immediately back to being a football playing knucklehead, you know, kept reading books, but got into college, had been working as a cowboy. And then uh, when I got into college, I had, an, uh, I, I had to get into nursing school. It was pretty tough. You had to have a certain grade point. There were two of us going for every position. And then once you got in, it was one of those, and I'm, I hope I don't get off the rails here, but it was one of those dread liberal arts educations. And I didn't like that. I came from a very straightforward farming background. And I remember being in introduction to film and going, this is a waste of my time. I should be in surgery class. Well, I was in surgery class. I was assisting in surgery, but I also one day just to fill a slot took a creative writing course and it changed my life. I walked in there and <clears throat> I remember we had to write a poem and I wrote a pretty bad poem and our professor was tough, man. He would hack your stuff up with a red pen and he'd read your stuff in front of the class and then critique it. <laughs> the, the thing that, and I think this was a big turning point, the thing that surprised me, I watched him critique other people's work and they kind of wilted or they'd take it personally. When he took my poem and said, this can be better and this line is trite and this and that, I responded, I felt like I was at football practice again, because I was always the kid who, when the, when the coach said, hit him harder, I'd go, well, okay. And when he said, you can write a better poem, this line, you can do a lot better. And I just went, okay. And I took it home and I worked on it and it did get better. So those two teachers planted a seed. But again, I was a nursing student. I had to keep my grades up. I got, I graduated. Then I had to take my state boards. I passed my boards. I got my license. I started working as a nurse. But somewhere in there, uh, I had started writing really bad poetry because of that creative writing class. Then I wound up going to a, an open mic poetry reading. I mean, you, I cannot tell you what a farm kid I was. <laughs> and I was at this poetry reading and I didn't know how to act or what to do, but I just found that I didn't, it, the, the thing was, I loved the sound of the words. And from there, it just expanded and I'll quick fast forward so that I'm not putting everybody to sleep. But No, you're point, not putting everybody to sleep. You keep talking, dude. The other really critical thing here, and this has to do, I think, with class and culture and all that, is for a kid who grew up reading every book I could get my hands on, it never occurred to me that a guy like me from a place like where I came from could write books. That was for authors, capital A, writers, capital W. There were two things that helped me, and one was I grew up reading, I read every Louis L'Amour book ever printed five times. My dad, there's a quote, I think, in Truck, the book I wrote, uh, that my dad said he lost more man hours to Louis L'Amour than to football trucks, girls, and pickups combined. Because <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be time to milk the cows or clean the calf pens, and he'd have to come find me because I'd have my nose in a Louis L'Amour book. But I would always, every time I finished the book, I would go, Louis had a little bio at the back. And if you read it, it was it said, you know, he grew, he was from North Dakota and he worked on freighters and he was a he boxer. Was a boxer and wheel skinner. Yes. yes. So that that even even though I still didn't get it, I think that helped plant a seed. And then um, the other thing is, here I was kind of writing bad poetry, but not really knowing what to do. And a friend of mine who was a librarian wrote an article about canoeing a local river and she sold it to a regional magazine. And she told me this, and I, and I literally, this is how farm kid I was. I went, oh, I didn't know you could get paid for writing. And so I went to the local library and I checked out a book. It was called The Writer's Market. Um, but in, in essence, it's how to be a freelance writer is what that book is. And I read it and I just took it. I, I took it so literally. I just started writing proposals, sending out ideas to, uh, and writing stuff and, and learning how to submit things. And and from there, it just sort of grew until one day um, I hitchhiked all around Europe in the summer of 89 and wrote every day, not really knowing why. And then when I got back, I had a good nursing job. I was a single knucklehead. I had a little bit of savings. And I thought, you know, I'm going to try this. And when it all goes to heck, 
you know, I've got enough savings to pay the rent for a couple of months. When it goes to heck, I got a nursing license. I'll just go back to being a nurse. And 30 years later, that is still the plan. Still the plan. Yeah. Oh, I renew that okay. nursing license every two years. <laughs> you know, one of the things that you mentioned just just then reminded me of something that I I I want I just want to tell tell you as as like a big fan of yours. Uh, you mentioned what was it you mentioned? I'm so ADD, Mike. I, I'm just like I, I'm all over the place. I I'm we can sorry, do a but, whole nother. We can do a whole other show on that. Cause, I know. Uh, I was just like, oh, my gosh. But you, there was something you mentioned a minute ago that made me think about, uh, oh, I know what it was. You said you were the firstborn. So there is uh, there are several books you have that are of essays, all right? Uh, but you, you write a regular column, Roughneck Grace, that, uh, that I, I read those and and um, and you've got you've you've also got a new uh, a new thing Michael Perry's voicemail, which is a subscription that people can listen to every week to something that you're coming up with, which I think is brilliant. Um, but when you mentioned the firstborn, it reminded me of something that I talk about to people when I talk about you, and occasionally we'll have people over the house. I'll start talking about you. And I'll say, now, wait, wait just a second. Let me, go, let me go find this book. And my wife will go, oh, God, please don't, don't read this again. You know? But what book is it that you have the essay on Elvis? Do you remember? Because I can't oh, remember. <clears throat> well, that, you're probably reading that essay in a book called Off Main Street, which is a Off collection. Off Main Street, of right. Yeah, it was originally right. published in a book called Big Rigs, Elvis, and the Grand Dragon Wayne, which I self-published because that's how I got into this. So I self-published my first four books. Yeah. And then when Population 485 came out and did better than anybody expected, <laughs> including me, the publisher, uh, HarperCollins, did that thing where they go, what else do you have? You know, it's like that second album when sure. the first album does well. Sure. So See? off Main Street, yeah. I did, I did the, the same uh, thing, by the way. I self-published several books. Yeah. I had a book called The Traveler's Gift that hit. Yep. And it was yeah. like all of a sudden, you know, I'm like a, you know, a, a guy with no contract that had won 20 games, you know? Yeah. And so, but here's what I want to say about that. There are a lot of people who like Elvis. You know, my wife is one of them. My preacher is one of them. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I'm like, yeah, okay. You know, I always tease my wife uh, because she loves Elvis, and I'm, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's a good thing he's dead because if he was alive today, he would be Engelbert Humperdinck in Vegas doing, you know, donut commercials or something. No, he would not. And, and so I'm always teasing her about it. But I, I'm, I say that just to say, I'm not a particular Elvis fan. And there have been at least 20 million articles written about Elvis. But I got to tell you, that is the best article explanation about how that happened, about how he became such an icon, why he is still such an icon. That, that is some of the best thinking that I have ever read in my life about Elvis. And so I'm just telling people, you, you want to get an idea of how, because there, there are a lot of people who can write, but there are very few people who I think, uh, who I believe think deeply as they do so, yeah. right? I, 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 there, there are many things you and I have in common that I've noticed through the years. You know, we both deer hunt. We know what it's like to be in that stand by ourselves in that quiet thinking we uh, we've both read all louis lamore's books you know we uh, it, neither of us can diagram a sentence i i could not do that in high school and they told me they said you're going to have problems when you get to college because it's it's composition and you're 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 going to have problems and that was the only thing i did good at in college i don't know why i could do it but it was the only thing and and there was one teacher that that really kind of affected me too. And, but I, golly, man, that one, that Elvis one, and there is, uh, there's several like that. And, and before I ask you another question, I want to do something 
I, I want to do something for people. One of the things that that your newest book right now, I already have it, is called Million Billion. Brief essays on snow days, spit wads, bad sandwiches, dad socks, hairballs, head banging, bird love, and hope, which is the longest subtitle I've ever heard in my life, but it makes a certain kind of sense if you read Michael Perry like I do. Um, I, I have a, a, a really good friend that you and Jimmy need to meet. Uh, his name is Jimmy Yeary. Uh, Jimmy's a songwriter, and I know there's a lot of songwriters, but he's like a real one, you know. I, uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy's won uh, CMA uh, Song of the Year and ACM Song of the Year. He, he's the guy who wrote "I Drive Your Truck," um, the the song that Tim McGraw has out right now. I called Mama. Jimmy wrote that. He wrote Kenny Chesney's last two number ones. He's he's a songwriter. And he understands that writing process. And so one of the things that I love about what you do is what, what Jimmy says. Jimmy, Jimmy says, look, everything's been said. It's all been said. And so now we have to say it a different way. And we have to say it in a way that it, it can touch somebody's heart, that they can picture it in a different way. He's, and, and he explains, he says, I can say, I loved my dad. And you know what that means. But I could also say, I love the guy who taught me how to fish. And that's a different thing. Now, one of the things that I am a huge fan uh, fan of that that people you know it, it, and I know you get this all the time people saying well I'd like to write a book or how do you write a book and I don't know how to write a book and I always say yeah neither did I John Grisham didn't know how to write a book before he wrote a book and 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 writing writing memorable stuff is not necessarily what they teach you in high school, okay? Because uh, you know we're taught uh, that sentence is too long. You can't, you, you you can't do. But I think that there are long sentences that, if they're crafted correctly, they're like a song, and they make a certain kind of sense. And yeah, and there is one that I picked out. In your newest book, and I just want to read this. This is one sentence, people, and I just think this is brilliant, okay? I don't even have to tell you. I don't even have to give you any context. I'm just going to read this sentence and just tell me is this is great. All right. I have never been hung over in my life, and I'm not saying that cat was, but this was my first thought, and I went with it. Imagining him down at the kitty tavern till all hours, knocking back miniature beers and teensy chasers, maybe purring at some lady kitty and nudging the catnip chews her way, until he remembered he'd been fixed, at which point he retreated with his beer to the jukebox, where he slumped into more serious drinking, his pupil sad and wide in the barroom gloom, his tail limp. <laughs> I just love that. I just love that. And see, that's like a song. But, you know, you would get an F on that in high school because they'd say, that's too long. You know, you've reminded me of a couple of things. <laughs> we can we will have to do a whole show on ADD. And, and by the way, when I say that, I, I, I have a story. If we ever do that, I have a story I tell about how I got in trouble for using that term. But I, I have a daughter who suffers terribly from it and has worked her way through it and is getting good grades in college right now because she works hard. So when I invoke that humorously, I'm also aware of the, the, the cost and the tolls. So, but um, I'm just reminded that... Uh, I was criticized. I wrote a piece about being on the road with my band and, and, uh, and the end of it, the last sentence, occasionally a guy likes to try and be poetic. And, and I intentionally wrote a very long sentence to end that piece because 
I was replicating the feel of what it is to be on the road. You relate. It doesn't matter if you're in a band or if you're out on a book tour or whatever. If you're on the road a lot, this rhythm develops and you never quite have a chance to stop and slow down. And you have to explain to people what a huge deal it is if, you're, if your tour is arranged so that you get to stay in the same hotel room two nights in a row. People are like, well, is that a big, I got a huge deal. <laughs> it's a huge deal. Yeah. So, so I, I, the, the last sentence was, it was very intentionally kinetic, a lot of commas and just went on and on and on and just kind of went on like the road. I got an email from someone. You, I get edited by email a lot. Yeah. And this, yeah. that last sentence went on for, I think she had counted the words and she goes, do you even read your own stuff out loud? <laughs> <laughs> so, a, not everybody loves you when you make those artistic moves, but just to prove, remember earlier I said, I don't want people to think that I'm just beautiful and wonderful all the time. I'm a little passive aggressive. So for my very next column, I wrote a sentence that was even longer just <laughs> and just never said anything. Oh my gosh. But the oh one thing gosh. I also want to make clear is that uh, I tend to talk about, you know, you, you hear me talk. I start and stop. I, I mumble. I go off. I, if I start a sentence and it involves a who, whom decision, I'll take three left turns to avoid it. Um, and I really do not have a good grasp of the rules. But I'm also careful with that because sometimes that comes off as me being anti-academic or scorning people who truly study and understand writing. And it's important for me to say that when I was that knuckleheaded farm kid who went to the library and checked out the book, I also was the guy who, because of going to the poetry mics and meeting someone, wound up going to this bar, this smoky little bar. I don't smoke. I've never had a drink in my life, but I would go to this little bar in this little college town because that's where the English professors and the writers hung out. And some of them had MFAs and were very educated. And they really helped me. They took me under their wing. And so I'm always careful with that too, because I don't want to come off as the person that goes, well, nobody taught me nothing and I don't need to know nothing. No, I do need to know stuff. And right. there, are ways, there are different paths to, to, to arrive at that. I do think sometimes, you know, you mentioned that Elvis piece. I do think sometimes it is okay though, if for instance, I wrote an Elvis piece as a non-Elvis fan, not in a negative sense, not to no. take him, but rather yeah. to say, I really want to understand this. And sometimes, like I just wrote a book uh, that really was not very popular with a lot of my audience, which I predicted. I told my, uh, uh, my editor when I signed the contract, I said about half of my audience isn't going to care for this book. And I was right. Was it the Montaigne book? Yeah, the Montaigne book. But I also, and, and to, to finish my thought before I ADD on to the next thing, <laughs> uh, part of the reason I wanted to write the Montaigne book is because I have a great respect for academicians and philosophers who take their studies seriously. But what I also struggle with is when that doesn't translate to the ground level. And so I knew I'd get criticized for being a guy who knew nothing about 16th century French philosophy, but I was literally sitting in my deer stand reading him and saying, you know, I'll just write this book and, and react to what he says. And so I think it's okay sometimes to come to things without knowledge, as long as you come in a spirit of learning. And also to I'm really trying to keep my brain on, on the point I wanted to make. No, that's okay. Keep going. Um, the thing about the Montaigne book, and, and there's a lesson in this too, for me, I knew a certain amount of people would not care for that book stylistically, content-wise. I got pretty personal in there, and I'm aware that not everybody agrees with the way I see things. But not since Population 485 have I written a book where I have received more heartfelt correspondence handwritten letters, emails, got two just last week about it, messages. And so that tells you something. It's like, you know, that one didn't make everybody happy, but it, but it really connected with some people on a level that the other books haven't. So right. I don't even I, know what the... I, I understand writing books that people feel like are out of your wheelhouse. I wrote a book uh, called How Do You Kill 11 Million People? And... <laughs> And so that was like, people said, well, that's not really kind of what you write. Now, yeah, yeah, I, I know. Um, but you learn. I would show the Montaigne book to everybody, but it's actually, <laughs> it's actually, I, I will send you a picture of it when we're, okay. when we're through today. Um, because th this, I know you can't see this, but this table is... Uh, is part of the, a book, uh, the latest book I wrote. And the legs 
are books. Oh man! And, yeah. And so, uh, Coop ah. and Population Four Eighty Five are in that leg. Uh, Montaigne is in this leg, and I think Truck is in that leg. But see, I love stuff like that because. Uh, be, be, People say, you know, have you ever won a Pulitzer? I go, no, but I'm holding up Andy Andrews' desk. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Man, you know, it, you know, before when we were hooking this up, Matt, uh, who, who is our, he's, he's my brains here. And I, I, I can talk and I can write. I don't necessarily know why it's right, but I can do those things, but I can I can barely turn on a computer. I just I'm just te I'm a technological moron, and so uh, Matt Limpert is he's like my brains here, and Matt leaned over. I told Polly before I left the house today. I said, "Guess what I get to do today?" And she said, "What?" I said, "I get to talk to Michael Perry." She said, "Oh my gosh! Oh, this is so great!" And so Matt he comes in and goes, "Michael Perry today, right?" And I said, "That's right, that's right." He says. Don't ever come in my barn. Do you remember what that line is from? I I listened to um, uh, the Clodhopper monologues, uh, which yeah. you guys, you can get these things on sneezingcow.com. Uh, there, there's a couple of, just, there's just stories, just Michael telling stories. And the, yeah. the, the Clodhopper monologues, has that place. I have the clip. I have it marked because I play it for people and I go, listen to this. And about you, and at the end, and I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna tell people what it is, but your brother coming up and going, don't ever come into my yeah. barn again. I this is one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my life. So, yeah, I'm tempted to explain it, but you're right. You'll just leave it. Yeah, yeah you just, just leave it. Things. Just Stay leave it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And and I and the story the story of your mother uh, getting the wheat for your cereal oh, yeah. that that is uh, and I, yeah, I think so, I think so much of why uh, I think that people should read should read you there 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 are people who can create fiction. And there are people who uh, do a great job at nonfiction. Now, I've always felt, you know, because, you know, you meet these people who go, I only read nonfiction. You know, it's like, oh, wow, well, well, good for you, you know. And I, I've always felt like people need a combination of both because I think that nonfiction will bring you facts, but the fiction can fire your imagination in a way that the facts won't. And if you don't have the imagination to use the facts in a different way that everybody else is using it, then maybe you're at a disadvantage. But there are a few people like you who can write nonfiction in such a way that it uh, it almost seems like a it's just it's like a great novel. I hope so. And and to speak to your point, um, that is I do read fiction for just that reason. But that's especially also why I still love to read poetry. I figured out two things. As I said, poetry was kind of my gateway, um, but. I figured out two things real early. Number one, I wasn't a very good poet. And number two, it's pretty tough to make a living as a poet. <laughs> it's it's got to be today. Whereas you write fiction, uh, nonfiction, you can, you can write about Elvis for a magazine. But what I always let people know is that I still, despite not writing a lot of poetry, I read poetry all the time at this point. And num I hope it informs my fiction. You know, you say the word nonfiction and sometimes people go, oh, boring facts. They go, well, no, you know, hopefully, as you just said, you can write nonfiction in such a way that it maintains the facts, but is presented in a way that is entertaining or leads you forward or novelistic, whatever that is. The other thing I think that's a, a barrier, and it was for a, a guy like me, and I still fight it. I'll hear people say, well, poetry, I just don't get it. I say, well, the last two words there is your problem. Don't worry about getting it. Just feel it, taste it. Like one of my favorite poets of all time is Dylan Thomas. I mean, a drunken lout, uh, the more you read about him, the less desire, you know, you wouldn't want to hang out with him. But he wrote this poetry. And again, I'm a guy, and this is not me uh, putting myself up as an example or anything. This is just 
how things have turned out. I've never had a beer. I've never smoked a cigarette. Uh, I smoked a stage cigarette one time, some cigars when I was on stage, but um, <clears throat> never uh, taken an illicit drug. Um, and so for me, reading Dylan Thomas is the closest I get to hallucinogens because the way he put, <laughs> the way he put words together, I just can't even comprehend. And I've had so many people say, well, I just don't get him. And I go, well, I don't get it either, but it's wonderful. And it causes me to think about, oh, I could throw these two words together. Let's see what happens. Uh, let's try this sequence rather than that sequence. And he, Dylan Thomas himself said something I'll never, I never have forgotten. And I think about it all the time. He said that he chose words for their taste over their meaning which I think is a lovely way to proceed, especially in the early going. And so yeah. I, uh, I just, I agree with you. I think the more genres that you can read, songwriters are, you know, I, I, I was a big, uh, Waylon Jennings and uh, was my gateway to country music because I grew really? up not caring. Well, I grew up not caring for country music um, and not hearing a lot of music because of the church situation I described earlier. Sure. But then I worked out in a, I worked on that ranch in Wyoming. And when you drive a, a ranch truck in Wyoming and you turn the radio on, you ain't going to hear nothing but country music. <laughs> right. And so I pretty quickly started to sort of listen and then like a few things, but my, uh, I'll tell this story quickly. You can cut it if it's not relevant. No, uh, you're not cutting anything in this. Here's how I came to Waylon Jennings. And I've got, I've got his album framed right over there because I get asked a lot about writing influences. And I do have literary influences and I have certain writers I can name. But people like Waylon Jennings, uh, Steve Earle, um, James McMurtry, people like that were big influences on me, John Prine, early on because every single one of them had some sort of blue collar tie. They sent me this message that, you know, you can still be a roughneck or you could work as a mailman. Um, you could grow up picking cotton and you could still be an artist. And it, they expanded my idea what that was. Anyway, here's how I discovered Waylon Jennings. And when I look back now, I cringe, but this is the true story. So I'm working on that ranch in Wyoming. I went out early one summer and helped with the irrigating. Now, we, it was about a 12,000 acre beef and hay ranch. Big to me is a farm kid from Wisconsin, but not big by Western standards. But still, you got to flood irrigate thousands of acres of, 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 of meadows and hay fields. And I loved the irrigating because you were mostly alone all day under the huge sky. Elk Mountain was uh, right over my shoulder constantly. Um, and you just, you had a shovel and rocks and you, you cut little feeder dams and you had to read the land and see how it sloped and you'd try to dump water out, you know, sometimes a quarter mile from where you needed it to get to. And then within, the other thing I liked about it is like within four days, you could tell if you did a good job because things would either green up or they wouldn't. Right, and right. So, so you'd spend all this time out there. And so my boss and I are out and we're irrigating all day. And then it was a Wednesday and we had Wednesday night Bible study <clears throat> and we were way up on the plateau and we realized we were late for Bible study. So we jumped in his big, big old four wheel drive pickup truck and we cut for home and he is just hauling and he was a big, he's one of my all time mentors. He would hate the word, but that's what he was <laughs> and a big, big man in every sense. And so we're bombing back to try and get to Bible study. We, we're on the home meadow. We're on the home stretch. And one of the things that happens with flood irrigating is if, if someone cuts the hay over one of those feeder ditches, it looks like it's flat, but it, it, it ain't. And we hit one of those feeder ditches going about 60 mile an hour in that four-wheel drive truck. And, of course, it just smashed down and then up into the air and down again and everything in the cab shook loose. And... <clears throat> this eight track tape shot out from underneath the seat. And I looked down and I said, and this is the part I can't believe because I was at least 17 years old by then. I looked down and I said, well, who's Waylon Jennings? And my <laughs> boss said, son, you better jam that thing in there. <laughs> and so I, jammed in, I jammed that eight track into that truck player and I heard that ding, 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 that phase chicken picking. And then I heard Waylon and that was it, man. I, I was hooked forever. And uh, yeah, I still have that album cover. I'm looking at it right now. It's framed across the room because I just remember, you know, this is where I learned to love these things and see possibilities was through people like, like, you know, my boss was a great, one time I was, 
was uh, seeing a, had my eye on a young lady who was out of my league in a lot of ways. Like I just had no business. <laughs> and I was telling him about her. We were working in the shop, like I was hammering sickles or something. And he come by and, and we were talking to, and I said something about her and he just, he had known her for some time. And he turned and he looked at me and he said, son, run like you was being shot at. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much for being Thanks. with us. And, I, and, and listen, man, um, I want to get you on the Blue Plate Special. I, I want to do this again sometime with you. I think I, I really... I think people are going to just go nuts over this episode and I'm going to blanket Wisconsin. It just still makes me mad. There's people in Wisconsin that don't know who you are. Um, and so Greg Steinhouse, uh, Jake, a, a lot of you guys, you need, you need to find Michael Perry. And I'm going to do my part to make sure that people find you. By the way, the book Coop, you know, we mentioned, we mentioned Coop earlier because I asked Michael if if he could see the Coop from where he is above his garage. This is the book. It's it's um, Coop, a year of poultry, pigs, and parenting. This is one of my favorite books too. Mm -hmm. And 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 so a couple, just a, 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 the one question with kind of opposite answers here that I'd like you to just address before we go. Um, we're going to put every way we know how to get in touch with you in the show notes. And so people will be able to, um, find sneezingcow.com and they'll be able to find, uh, a, a Michael Perry's voicemail and roughneck grace and everything that, uh, that we can do to help. Um, but Michael, I'm curious what, what, as you look at the world right now and just, I don't know what you're writing right now. I don't know what you're thinking about writing. But what is it that you're excited about? And what is it that you're concerned about? Well, the excited part is always tough for me because I'm a stoic Scandahoovian. So <laughs> getting excited frightens me. <laughs> um, I always want an even keel. Um I would say that what excites me based on my personal experience, you know, I've written about this a lot in the last 10 years and I find myself returning to it again and again. I've had so many mentors who have led me, but I've also, I'm 56 now, I think. My kids were trying to help me remember how old I was yesterday. Um, I'm at that age where you, it's not that I'm ashamed of it or worried about it, but you just, I, I, I it's 50, yeah, 56, I guess. I know, um, I know. Yeah, but I'm at that point where I noticed a lot of my mentors hit this age and they tended to do one of two things. They either got very open to change in the future and what's coming. And by, by the way, let me be very clear. I'm not talking about trying to be hip and hang with the kids. Right. I'm also not talking about sacrificing your principles. But they're just open to change as a constant. And how do we navigate? I love that word. How do we navigate? As opposed to, I also have a certain amount of those mentors who, who became very bitter and brittle. And I think, you know, that can be applied to a larger picture. And <clears throat> so in thinking about this a lot, <clears throat> what encourages me, what if excites me is the young. I, I'm, a, I'm a guy and I've written, it's a, the line is in one of those books you've got there, you know, like, I think children are great, but I, I still, in our house, the grownups are still in charge, right? Right. So don't take, again, I'm, I'm qualifying all these things. This is not me going, oh, I think it, in, in one of my books, I said, <clears throat> you always hear people say, oh, if only we could be more like the children. And I was going, have you ever locked three kids in a room with two toys? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> sometimes the world is, not that you should lock three kids in a room with two toys. I'm going to get a call. I, I got gotcha. you. I totally <laughs> understand what you're saying. You know, like, Sometimes the world is like it is because we are like the children. So obviously it's how you parse it. But I just, you know, I want to be able to be a mentor to the young, but also 
I'll always be a little, uh, have my ears open a little bit to what they have to tell us too. And because they can, you know, my own children teach me things. And yeah, I still set the rules and I still drop the hammer when I have to, but I have things right. to learn from. So that, that excites me. That keeps me engaged trying to keep myself at that place where I'm not becoming bitter and brittle. As far as what concerns me, I think there's a running theme through my books. And I come from working class, roughneck, small town, rural, grew up with pickup trucks and hunting. And when I drop, a <clears throat> when I drop my gerund like I just did there, it's, you know, when I'm with my brothers, I mean, I was talking, you know, we was down to the cafe and we was talking to the chief about 30 out sixes. That's how I am most comfortable talking. I can elevate my prose. I, you know, that's a craft. That's something I've learned and that I appreciate. But that's my background. But even as early as Population 485, there's a chapter in there called My People. And what it means when someone like me even has the audacity to use a phrase like my people, as if I'm claiming them and as if they want to be claimed by me. And there's no question that there's a bifurcation. And I am concerned about that because I remember going to the implement store when I was a kid and the farmers are shaking dice <laughs> in the corner talking about how hard farming is while they're shaking dice. I can make fun of farmers because I are was one. Um, but, um, but they would tease each other about their views. And I, I fear we've lost some of that humor and elasticity. And I don't have any answer to that other than conversations like you and I are having. I'm very well aware of uh, where our, Venn diagram overlaps and doesn't overlap, but we can have a very congenial conversation. We can learn from each other. I agree. My neighbor down the road couldn't be rougher. And I would suspect that he and I are, we haven't even discussed it, but I would suspect that we may cancel each other's vote from time to time. Sure. When, but when we, I got to go somewhere, he comes up and feeds my chickens. And when he's sick, I go down and help with firewood or whatever. Um, that, that I guess both, in, that's something that I'm concerned about, but also encouraged by that you, you keep whatever thread you have, you keep it. I cling to it. So It's curious to me that both those things paid, paid attention to can, can really, you know, bind each other well. You know, the, the children and, and the, the thing you're concerned about. I, like, I couldn't agree more with both, both those things. I, I tell people all the time, look, we're not, we're not trying to raise great kids. We're trying to raise kids who become great adults. It's two oh, different things. Yeah. Two different things. You know, uh, as we close, um, one of the things that I haven't mentioned on the show, it's kind of a sad thing for me lately one of the the uh i guess the dreams that i had this table this whole setup is fairly new to me uh this studio and there are five seats at this table and and i am you know my I, i'm intending to have conversation we call this the peace table and I'm intending to have conversations around here. And one of the, the first that I imagined and have imagined, I, I, I guess my kind of my number one on my dream list of the conversations, uh, got kind of a kink thrown into it last week. And a lot of people are, are not aware of this, but uh, Winston Groom passed away. Um, Winston lives uh, or lived 20 minutes from us here. And Winston is the guy who wrote Forrest Gump and uh, quite a few historical uh, pieces, just a, a brilliant, brilliant man. And he was always very kind to me. And one of the dreams that I had, I said, one day I'm going to get Jimmy Geary, the songwriter, I'm going to get Michael Perry. I'm going to get Winston Groom. And, and, and me and, and me, Anthony Crawford, who has written songs, that just totally different kind of writer than Jimmy. And, and we're going to talk about writing. 
I just want to I want to hear what these guys have to say. And so it's sad to me that Winston is gone, but what a legacy he has left. And and you are one of those guys that I think that people are finding out about and will remember forever. These books are great, Michael. And I appreciate you so much. Appreciate your time today. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. I'll see you down the road. Absolutely. I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. Quick question. Where are you seeking wisdom? Allow me to suggest wisdomharbor.com. That's wisdom, H-A-R-B-O-U-R. Stuff being added all the time, wisdomharbor.com is absolutely incredible. This is something for your family, for your business, for your schools, all different docs in Wisdom Harbor, and then you'll use them all. Check it out. It's a free five-minute guided tour, wisdomharbor.com, wisdom, H-A-R-B-O-U-R, Dot com. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing the tiny bit of mental energy I have for you, seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, smile while you talk, even behind that mask. Don't breathe anyone else's air yet, but make sure you have a positive answer to the question. How's it going? And so, until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Candied apples. Candied apples provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by PoodleFloss.com. Are you determined to keep your teeth and gums healthy, but equally determined to be environmentally friendly? Rising oral health awareness among consumers has now made dental floss a $500 million business. Did you know that 3 million miles of dental floss is used in the United States each year? Unfortunately, most dental floss is made from nylon, a plastic commonly used in the manufacturing of consumer goods. So that's 30 million miles of non-biodegradable plastic being draped across America's landscape every decade. Fortunately for the future of our country, the good people at PoodleFloss.com are providing an answer. Having contracted with dog groomers the world over, the organic clippings from poodles have been saved and by way of a unique process woven into fine spools of organic fur. Available waxed or unwaxed, poodle floss, when used properly, still maintains that faint essence of wet dog to assure you that you've made an all-natural choice that will contribute to the saving of our planet. That's poodlefloss.com, available in three sizes, standard, miniature, and toy.